Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission's Wild Science Webinar. Uh, this month, we'll be hearing from our malacologist, Kendall Moles, uh, who will be talking about a couple of undescribed uh, uh, muscle species in Arkansas, as well as large carnivore program coordinator, Myron Me will be talking about reproduction and recruitment in black bears in Arkansas. How did it work out? I mean, did you run around and just try to get a photo of every person that was there or what? I would encourage everybody there. We got a little background noise to uh, please, please mute your microphone during the presentations. And uh, we will have about 15 to 20 minute presentations from, from each of our presenters today, uh, at which time, at the end of which time, we will take some questions and answers for five or 10 minutes each. Uh, uh, if you've got a question you want to type into the comment section during the presentation, feel free to do so and we'll address those. I'll ask those at the uh, end of each uh, presenter's topic. Uh, just a reminder that we are uh, this is for an internal audience, essentially, this live uh, webinar this morning, but we will be recording this and making it available to the public on our uh, YouTube agency YouTube channel uh, in a couple of days. So uh, internal this morning, but, but it, it will be disseminated to the public. Uh, as my colleague Randy Zeller said this morning, we are talking, uh, because we like alliteration in, uh, in the word department downstairs, uh, we're talking bivalves and Bruins. Uh, and to get things kicked off, uh, Kendall Moles will, will start us off today. Uh, Kendall has served as our malacologist and also as a commercial fishing biologist for the last five years. He's a native of Dardanelle and grew up hunting and fishing in the Arkansas River Valley. Kendall got his bachelor's degree in fisheries and wildlife biology from Arkansas Tech before moving over to Tennessee and uh, getting a master's in fisheries biology from Tennessee Tech and uh, later uh, his PhD in environmental science uh, in biology. Uh, prior to working for Game and Fish, Kendall worked for over a decade as a research associate for the U.S. Geological Survey's Tennessee Cooperative Fishery Research Unit and worked on numerous fish and mussel projects across most of the southeastern and uh, eastern U.S. Uh, from basic research projects such as distribution and the status of rare taxa, life history studies and determining in-stream flow needs of mussels uh, to complex multi-state conservation projects including augmentations, reintroductions and even establishing non-essential experimental populations of endangered mussels. Kendall Moles? Take it away. Thank you, Trey. Hopefully my screen should be coming up now. We got it, Kendall. You got it, okay. All right, first of all, I wanna thank everybody for taking time out of their busy work day today to uh, come learn something new. Um, hopefully, there we go. Uh, you'll learn something about some freshwater mussels. <clears throat> Not a lot of people have, uh, even though they exist, uh, so there's going to be a lot of new information, so I'm going to try to break down something that's kind of complex um, to some basic ecological principles today for everyone. <clears throat> and so uh, 20 plus years ago when I was a young aspiring malacologist, even though I'm still aspiring today, um, I collected um, a mussel on a tributary to the south fork of the Fush Lafave. Uh, on, a, on a fish project, and this mussel was outside of its normal habitat. It was way up in the headwaters, not in what we consider classic mussel habitat. Uh, and to me, it was very, very odd of why that mussel was up there. Um, and it turns out it was at the time considered uh, the Louisiana fat mucket, Lampsilis hydiana. Um, hydiana is, is more of a big river species. We find it in large numbers um, across the state, primarily in, in the Washita Red River drainage and, and the Arkansas River drainage. Um, there are a few scattered records in the white system. It's not very common at all over there. Um, but the problem arises that wherever you collect this animal in the major watersheds, it looks a little different. And especially when you start getting into the headwaters, of these systems, they look very, very different. Well, um, 
one of my colleagues, Dr. John Harris, uh, a few years back, and part of a large genomics project uh, for Muscles of Arkansas, pulled samples from these headwater individuals and found that they were distinct valid taxa. Um, John is currently in the process of the formal descriptions of these. Uh, so uh, the, the common name uh, for the Arkansas River drainage is the Arcoma fat mucket. And what we find in the Red River drainage is the Red River fat mucket. And the Washita River still has the, Wash the Louisiana fat mucket. And so if we go back to our map, we can see this distribution where um, the Arcoma fat mucket is allopatric to, to the other species. Um, there is some sympatry that occurs between the Red River fat mucket and the Lu Louisiana fat mucket in the Red River system. Um, typically, the, the Red River fat mucket inhabits the headwaters, uh, the, more the tributaries, whereas the Louisiana fat mucket stays more towards the larger rivers. But there is a zone of overlap for these species. But they are valid taxa. <clears throat> um, and so since they are valid and they are species of greatest conservation need in our AWAP plan, uh, so I initiated a project um, a couple of years ago to determine the life history of these species and to fill the data gaps and the needs for management. <clears throat> and, and also to kind of confirm some biological traits that may differ uh, between species to kind of help bolster the genetic data. Even though genetic data can confirm a species, it's nice to have biological data that says, yes, there are traits and differences among these individuals, okay? So my site selection um, for the Arcoma fat mucket and the Red River fat mucket is, is high into the, up into the watershed along with the Louisiana fat mucket. So people that are familiar with the area around Mena, uh, the Arcoma fat mucket came from a, around a little town called Blancet in the Black Fork of the Push Lafave. And the Red River fat mucket came out of the mountain fork of the Little River, way up in the Little River watershed. Um, and then the Louisiana fat mucket site specific individuals came from around Acorn. People that are familiar with this area uh, know those streams up there kind of become seasonally discontinuous, um, which means that on the photo on the right will show, you know, you have stream flow during this time of the year. When we get into late summer, uh, the streams begin to dry and you have just very little stream flow. And this is very odd. Um, you know, these species can inhabit these smaller streams, as I stated earlier, and this is usually where very few mussel species can persist. You find a few species mixed in here and there. There's never large numbers like there are of these species. Um, so this species may truly be what we consider a headwater species. So in a, in a true life history project, we look at a lot of things like the spawning, the brooding, the fertilization, fecundity or how many larvae a female produces, the host fish, sexual maturity, age and growth, sex ratios, all kinds of population demographics. And for people that aren't familiar with the life history of freshwater mussels, it's a very unique life cycle. Um, Freshwater mussels are obligate parasites of fishes, meaning that they have to have a host to complete their life cycle. And it's, it's unique. It's not in any other bivalves that we know of. It's not in marine bivalves um, or any other freshwater bivalves. It's just what's classified as Unionidae as the freshwater mussels. Um, so the males are sperm casters. They broadcast their sperm into the water column. It's siphoned in by the females. And then within the females' marsupial gills, they kind of have these little pouches, if you will, or water tubes where they hold the eggs, the eggs are fertilized, and then they develop into the um, parasitic stage called a glycidium in that little center circle. They look like little miniature bear traps. And so through, through various methods, the female mussels, depending upon species, will attach their larvae onto the gills or fins of their host fish, at what point they collapse onto the gills or the fins, 
become covered in epithelial tissue, stay on there for anywhere from two to six weeks, metamorphose into a juvenile and fall to the substrate. So it's a very unique, complex life cycle. And <clears throat> the part of the thing that we want to know is, is when are our females spawning? So we go out routinely examine females and then we find for the Red River Fat Market in early September, we find eggs that are fertilized. Then we go back in late September, there are fully developed viable glochidia, okay? So this is a behavior that, that we call long-term brooding or Brady tactic, where the females hold the larvae throughout the winter until the following spring. And then at this point, they release their glochidia to, onto the fish um, and do what we consider to be infesting the fish, okay? So as we can see by late May, females, 100% of the females I uh, examined were still fully gravid. We get into early June, females, be, you know, we're becoming less gravid. Um, by the time we get to the end of June, early July, you know, we have no, we don't have no gravid females. So they've expelled all their glochidia um, onto the host fish. And this, this is the same pattern we see in the Louisiana fat market, also in the Arcoma fat market except uh, there is some variation dependent on water temperature and water temperature is really what drives this so the warmer the streams versus the cooler streams this can happen at different time intervals so there was no difference in spawning and brooding behavior but when we look at the actual larvae the glochidia that is produced um, we do see a difference in size and and it is a statistically valid uh, difference in size between the Arcoma fat market and the Red River fat market. And then people ask me all the time, can you identify larvae on a fish? And yes, you can. If you, if you have the measurements and the range of sizes, you can identify. So we see from, from the larvae here, which, you know, these are about the size of popcorn salt, if, if you're familiar with popcorn salt. Um, there are differences in sizes. So when we, we, we think about how many larvae does a female produce we talk about total fecundity and as we all know that um, resources are very limited especially in headwater streams so what we see in this instance is we see female red river fat muckets um, are fairly fecund for their size um, just for simplicity and, and clarification i did not put on the louisiana fat mucket data it overlaps very nicely with the Red River fat mucket data, but it gets a little bit confusing when we start talking about negative binomials um, and interpreting the data. So I left that off. But <clears throat> if we look at the, the uh, fecundity of the female Arcoma fat muckets, and for people who aren't familiar with the negative binomial, that RR number is basically like a rate reduction number. So it's, it's kind of the stress that's put on the line in both directions. Um, and it tells us that uh, our coma fat mucket females of any given size are on average 41% less fecund than red river females. Um, and this, is, this to me was very odd, having done fecundity on dozens of Brady Tictic mussels in my time, um, it, it's driven by size. So it's a combination of size and of the female and size of the, of the larvae. So a lot of times you see real nice overlap. And so when I plotted this data initially, I went back and, and had to double check it because I thought I messed up on my counts, I messed up on the estimates. Um, but I went back and checked it again and everything was correct. Um, so that was, that was very problematic to me because that was unique. I had not seen that before. So couldn't figure out, had a no plausible reason why that was there. Um, but we'll circle back to that in a few minutes. So when we talk about, we have larvae, how do the female mussels get the larvae onto the fish? Well, uh, most Brady Tictic species will have a lure. And for people that aren't familiar with what a mussel lure is, we can see this female sitting with her mantle, this is a modified mantle, and he's trying to entice them to come strike at this lure. 
when the fish strikes at this lure, he will expel the larvae into his mouth, and then he will be infested with the larvae. Um, so this is a kind of coevolution occurring together. You know, freshwater mussels, as we know them, have been around about 200 million years. And since they, it's a symbiotic relationship with their host, there's a lot of coevolution going on. And we can tell from this lure here that we see an eye spot um, on the lure. Um, we see a little bit of banding in the lure, but it's nothing that's it's super unique. Um, if we look at the Red River Fat Mucket, it has a similar lure, but it has no eye spot, and it has a lot of real dark banding. Uh, some of the females that I examined in the wild, their, their lure was almost completely black. Um, the Arcoma fat mucket um, is a gray, kind of a universal gray with, with no black in it, no eye spot. So here again, we have more confirmation that these are unique species um, since they have different lures. So when we get into host fish part of the life cycle, to determine host fish, we normally go out and we collect the host fish from the wild. We bring them in and we, and we get a you know, complimentary sample of everything in the stream, and we bring them in, we physically remove the larvae from the female mussels, uh, place it onto the gills of the fish, and we hold fish in these recirculating systems like you see here, and we wait for that transformation process to happen to confirm what the hosts are. Well, we noticed the lures from the female mussels I showed you the photos of, and typically when you see that, it's going to be a passivorous fish because those lures are trying to mimic a minnow or a dart or some sort of prey item. And so it's, it's no surprise that we see our, our usual suspects, if you will, um, you know, largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, spotted bass, green sunfish, you know, fish that feed primarily on other fish. Um, the one interesting thing that sticks out is, is the Arcoma fat mucket did not transform on smallmouth bass. And this is um, probably an artifact of the fish that were, was used. These smallmouth bass did not come out of the Arkansas River drainage. These smallmouth bass came out of the Washita River drainage. So as I stated previously, this is a coevolutionary process that's been going on for millions of years. So it could be that it's a different strain of bass genetically. Um, they did not recognize it. And, and so just to clarify, the larvae of a freshwater mussel, the glochidia, does not reject the fish. It's the fish's immune system that rejects the larvae. So when you put larvae of, of a freshwater mussel onto a fish that's not a true host, the fish's immune system will recognize it as a foreign body and then will begin to wall it off and make it slough and fall off, ultimately killing the juvenile. Um, so, you know, some follow-up work. I need to go back into the uh, Arkansas River Valley, pull out some smallmouth and test those to see if uh, they still transform or if this was just an artifact of bringing fish from another major drainage. So one of the things that we look at in, in life history studies is, is size at age. And if we look at size as a function of age and we plot a growth curve, like this basic von Berlanti growth curve, you know, we see that males are larger than females. And as I stated previously, um, reproduction is a huge resource sink for most animals, especially for freshwater mussels. When you have females that are producing tens of thousands of larvae, um, it takes a lot of resources to do that because that also hinders their ability to respirate because they're taking up space in their gills and it hinders their ability to feed while they are gravid. So it's, it's not surprising to see this. This is common in most long-term brooders. Um, you know, when I see this, it does not surprise me at all. It's the status quo. It's what we should see. The problem becomes the Arcoma fat market. So, um, and, and all of these uh, aging processes, 
we go in and we, we thin section the shell and we count the growth arrest just like you would in aging a tree. Um, so when I plotted this data and analyzed it, I thought, well, clearly I've made a mistake. I mean, I have done something wrong because I have never seen this before. Like I said, dozens of, dozens of species, I've never seen this. And I couldn't figure out what was wrong and, and, um, until um, I, I thought back on the fecundity issue, okay? And I stated that, that reproduction is, is a resource sink. So what is going on with the Arcoma fat market? Okay, are they, they're growing the same rate of males, but they're producing less larvae. What's the benefit? Why? So then we come back to, we come back to that, that photo I showed you earlier of the site. This is a site specific site from the uh, Arcoma fat market study site taken during the summer when these streams become seasonally discontinuous. So then I started thinking, well, is, is this a benefit to the species to, to have this sort of reproduction? Um, is it an evolutionary adaptation to inhabit these smaller streams? Meaning they have taken a different life history trait than other mussels and have just said, you know, we're, gonna, we're not gonna sacrifice growth over reproduction. Um, or is this a physiological response? Are we so far up into the watershed and the, the resources are so limited that these females are choosing growth over reproduction? Um, you know, there's a lot of questions here. And is this unique to the Arcoma fat bucket? That's the question I'm very curious about is, I've never seen this in another species, but I've never worked this high up into a watershed. Um, and it also makes me think, you know, is this a site-specific influence on this population? Um, I have, still have a lot of questions to answer on this. So stay tuned. Hopefully in a year, I'll have more of these answers. Um, but with that, I want, I want to thank everybody that's helped me uh, in the last couple of years on this project. Um, if your name's not on there, I'm sorry, but um, I, I appreciate the help. And also, I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. Um, and you know where I work. Anybody wants to get out in the field and see some unique creatures, feel free to send me an email. With that, I'm done. Thank you, Trey. Thank you, Kendall. Uh, how about some questions? Who's Who's got a question on, on Kendall's presentation? Anybody got one? Hey, I'll, I'll, I'll throw one up. Did somebody click in there? No, not yet. You know, you were, you were talking about some different uh, uh, species, you know, that these mussels have symbiotic relationships with. Have, have we done anything? You know, we've got some unique strains of smallmouth in Arkansas, Neosho, and Washita, and, and, and Northern. Are, are there differences? And for, forgive my ignorance as a layman here, but are there, are there, different species of mussels that may have different relationships with some of these kind of unique strains we, we have in Arkansas? Um, you know, to truly answer that would be nothing but pure speculation on my point. All I, all I can say is that this is coevolution occurring together, okay? So, you know, I would not be surprised to see where if you bring something in that's, that's from you know, way outside the realm of, of this drainage that you would not have successful transformation, okay? Um, some of the work I've done in the past in, in East Tennessee, even though you had the same species occurring in the Cumberland and the Tennessee drainage, you would not get uh, cross drainage transformation. And, and things, something like Cylindrica, there has been some work done by a graduate student out of Missouri on the rabbit's foot in Arkansas and there are some river specific species that are used. So it's like a population specific uh, fish that they're looking for. Thanks, Kendall. Anybody uh, got other questions for Kendall? Yeah, Chris uh, asked how long, where, where we go, uh, there it went. How long do these species live? Is there typically a difference in lifespan between headwater species and other mussel species from Chris Medall? 
Yeah, so typically when we talk about headwater species, they're typically shorter lived individuals and, and they attain a much smaller size. Um, so, you know, you can have a, a, a big river species, something like Actinanias, um, you know, in, in, in the lower, lower Washita, lower white, that could be 50 plus years old. Um, if you notice from the uh, Von Burtz that I presented today, you know, we're talking most of these mussels live less than a decade. Matt Schrader asks, what is the oldest species of mussel that you've aged and what was its age? And Matt, uh, I would note that I got your name right this time. <laughs> uh, the oldest would be um, Cumberlandia monodonta, the spectacle case. Um, a project working on the Washita River, which is the most southern extent of, of that species. The age, uh, maximum ages that I have uh, validated is 58. Um, I, I don't think 70 years is out of the range of possibilities based on the length frequency histogram, because since the uh, Cumberlandia monodonta is uh, federally endangered, I can't go out and kill the large individuals. I can't kill any of them. So I only have to use fresh dead material and I've not been able to find any fresh dead individuals of that maximum size. So I wouldn't put 70, 75 out of the range of possibility for Cumberlandia. All right, who else has got questions? Anybody? All right, going once, going twice. Kendall, thank you so much. Uh, we'll move on to Myron Means now, who's going to talk about black bear reproduction and recruitment. Myron's official title is statewide large carnivore program coordinator for the Game and Fish, Commis Game and Fish Commission. He received a Bachelor of Science degree from Arkansas Tech in Fisheries and Wildlife Management and a Master of Science in Biological Sciences from the University of Arkansas Fayetteville. Myron just started his 25th year with Game and Fish and his 12th as Large Carnivore Program Coordinator. Prior to that role, Myron was a field biologist and assistant regional supervisor in the Wildlife Management Division. Myron Means, take it away. Myron, it looks like we've got your whole screen there with the with the Google meeting. Turn turn your microphone on too, Myron. Myron, you're 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 yeah, uh, there we go. Got it. Am I presenting yet? Where did I find this thing? I opened it up the other day in the window. Do I have it yet? Try the, uh, there we go. Now you might try, bingo. You got it. Okay. Apparently my dress rehearsal, uh, I've forgotten how to do it since then, so. All right, so uh, really, in order to uh, discuss black bear reproduction and recruitment, uh, we're really talking about monitoring uh, black bears, uh, monitoring effort that goes into reproduction and recruitment. And so I kind of changed, uh, you know, the title around a little bit. Uh, but we do monitor reproduction and recruitment every year from the bears that we have in the sample and it's really it's a lot more involved process than just running in uh in the winter time when they're in their dens and uh, counting cubs it's really more of a year-long effort that goes into monitoring this effort and so uh i kind of broke that down into the monitoring monitoring components of reproduction and recruitment and there's really four main components of doing this uh, with bears. 
as far as the bear program goes. Uh, the primary component is the research capturing that we do. Uh, then uh, the pre-den assessments uh, that we conduct on all of our females. And really that's uh, kind of separate in and of itself from the, from the den work and data collection that we do with the females and with the cubs. And then uh, probably the, uh, the final component, but certainly not the least component, is the public participation and uh, education that we have uh throughout these uh monitoring components so let's talk a little bit about the research captures kind of what goes into the research captures and uh in arkansas we usually conduct research capturing uh in may through june and uh for those of you that may not be uh real familiar with the reproductive cycle of bears. I thought I would just run through it really, really quick and hit the highlights. Uh, May through August is really the breeding season for bears in Arkansas. Uh, that's when the females are bred by the males. Of course, uh, the egg is fertilized. The blastocyst kind of floats around in the uterine cavity for a while. And then in the fall, probably about the time that the female, pregnant female, will go into the den cycle, that's when the blastocyst will attach and complete the gestation period. And bears are born in Arkansas typically in mid-January, maybe latter part of January. Uh, they're born fully developed, five to eight ounces, about the size of a Coke can. And there they sit while the mother uh, is in her estivation state and they sleep and eat and sleep and eat for the next um, roughly four months. At the, usually in April is when the female will emerge with cubs. Uh, the cubs will stay with the mother the rest of the spring and summer and actually go into that next den cycle, their second den cycle as yearlings. Uh, they'll stay with the mother through that den cycle. She will typically emerge quicker with yearlings. Uh, and typically in mid-February, late February, early March, she will allow those yearlings to stay with her for another month or two, and then long about April or May, she'll drive her yearlings away and start her reproductive process all over again. So uh, in May through August is typically when we try to capture adult females. Most of the time we're using snare equipment as you see in the picture. And uh, we, we try to trap all across bear ranges in the state, the Ozarks, the Washita Bear Range, the Gulf Coastal Plain, which also includes the Lower White River area. We try to target adult females. Uh, we can put collar on yearling females, uh, but the only issue with putting collars on sub-adult females, the ones that are a year and a half or two and a half years of age, is the fact that very small bears can fit in very small places. And they're usually smaller places than uh, adults can fit into or people can fit into. So you, you can run the risk of having a bear grow into their collar too much. And if you can't reach them the first year they're in a den, and then you can't reach them the second year they're in a den because it's too tight or whatever, you're gonna have two years of growth on a bear before you can even adjust their collar. So we really try to target adult bears, bears that are at least three and a half years of age. And uh, if we think, you know, if we think we can get to them, we'll put them on them at two and a half years of age. Uh, the hog trapping that, you know, the biologists have been doing across the state has actually proven to be kind of a win-win for the hogs and the bears. Uh, because uh, bears show up at hog traps and you have them on video and you can obviously tell if it's a female with cubs and everything. So it's kind of easy pickings on, on trapping a female with cubs at a hog bait site. So uh, that's, uh, that's proven to be a real win-win. Another thing with the research captures is we really try to have good spatial distribution of bears across bear range. 
you know, if we end up with holes, if bears drop collars, if we have some collared bears poached or something that leaves big gaps in our distribution across bear range, we'll try to fill those gaps in the summer. Uh, uh, we try to have a significant sample size for each bear population. Uh, we like to have 25 plus bears distributed across each bear range. Uh, the Ozarks, the Wash Talls, and the Gulf Coastal Plain and White River. Uh, just simply because, uh, as I mentioned about the reproduction process of bears, in a given year, say if you have 30 bears across the Ozarks, uh, in any given year, you may only have half of those females that are in a cub cycle that's going to be providing reproductive information. If, uh, if you have half of them or 15 or so that are in a cub cycle, and then you're only able to access maybe 75% of those sows to do cub counts and collect data on them. And then, then all of a sudden you're down to, you know, 10 or 11 bears uh, that are in a cub cycle that you're going to be utilizing that data uh, as a representation of the whole population or that whole geographical population. So, we try to have uh, try to have a pretty good sample size, as many as we can, 25 or plus bears across that range. Now, the second uh, the second I guess component of monitoring is the pre den assessments, and I said as I said before, that's really a separate uh, component in and of itself. But we use the pre den assessments to uh, determine. A few things. Number one, uh, do we have accessibility to the den and not only to the den site, uh, but to the female that's at the den site? Uh, a lot of times uh, we may be able to get to the den, but we may not be able to get to the sow uh, in the den, whether the crevice is uh, too small. Uh, I know up in the Sillamore, these bears have a tendency to in your, their yearling cycle to get in, quote, caves. And I mean really deep caves. And I mean, it's a, you, you know, you're going spelunking to find a bear in these caves. Uh, that's not typical. It's, it seems to be typical in the Sillamore area. But a lot of times if the bear is in a really, really tight crevice that we can't fit into, or she's in a tree uh, that we can't access into the tree or something like that. We do do it. We do a pre den assessment on every single bear that we have collared, whether we think they're in a yearling phase, a cub phase, or they're in a barren. Uh, we also use those pre den assessments to determine if the sow is in a cub cycle or a yearling cycle or barren. Uh, in the normal course of things, uh, bears will have cubs every other year. Well, if, uh, if something happens to those cubs either in the den, uh, you know, she may breed again uh, that summer, uh, which means she may have cubs back to back years. Or if something happens to those cubs, her litter later on in the summer, uh, it may be out of the breeding cycle, breeding season window, and she may not breed again. So the following year, instead of having yearlings, she may be barren uh for whatever reason so that's information that we really need to know going before the den work is uh what females are we going to have that are in a cub cycle which ones are in a yearling cycle and so forth uh we do the pre-den assessments that's also when we perform yearling counts uh we try not to uh tranquilize the female just to simply count the yearlings uh, however, it can be it can be kind of tricky because one thing unique about sows that have are in a den cycle with yearlings is they always have the yearlings behind them in a crevice or a cave or something like that. And uh, I, I'm assuming they do this as a kind of a protective barrier from the outside world. I mean, uh, moms are pretending to are going to protect their cubs from anything coming in from the den, male bears, or any intrusion on any other critters or whatever people. Uh, but that's when we typically do our yearling counts. We have GoPro camera gear and everything else that we can put into these crevices. Uh, sometimes it's mostly just visual, 
but you have to be able to see all the way behind the sow. Uh, it's also a time that we use to do collar adjustments or replacements on young bears. If we have a bear that we know was maybe two and a half years old, uh, we know she's probably not going to have cubs that year. Uh, we may go in and loosen her collar up or something like that uh, if we can get to her. Uh, I got a really short video of a uh, of a yearling count, and you have to look real close. The bear looking at you at the start of the video, that's the sow. So we know the uh, yearlings are going to be behind her. And uh, just watch it, give it a good watch real quick. And if you'll see, there's an ear and a nose just flashed right in front of it right there. So there's one yearling right here. This yearling is obviously a different color phase. So we know there's two yearlings and then there's a black yearling right there and it's different from this brown or cinnamon colored bear. So we know this particular bear was Alice Ann. She had three cubs the previous year. We went in, did a count. She had three yearlings uh, a year later. So that's the way it should be. All right, let's talk about the den work that we do. The den work has kind of evolved into uh, a couple of different phases in and of itself. Uh, most notably, uh, the monitoring uh, for the sow health that we do now. And the reason why we have begun this monitoring effort on the sow is the drug that we used to use was simply a, a tranquilizer drug for the for the most part, it, it had no true anesthetic quality. It wasn't a true anesthesia drug. So therefore it just uh, immobilized the bear. And uh, you have to understand that during a den cycle, an adult female will be, her physiological processes will already be suppressed to a certain degree. Bears aren't true hibernators, they're estivators. So uh, but they can suppress their respiratory rates, their pulse rate, and things of that nature. So if you're going to use a drug, the drug that we use now has a true anesthesia component to it. Uh, so just like people being uh, under anesthesia in an operating room, uh, you, uh, there's an anesthesiologist monitoring the physiological processes of people. And we need to do the same thing with bears because they're already at a suppressed respiratory rate, pulse rate and everything like that because of their den cycle. Uh, if we put them under anesthesia, they can drop a pulse rate from say four times a minute down to two times a minute, you know, two respirations a minute and they can drop their pulse rate down. And if they're doing things of that nature and they drop down too low, uh, oxygen levels in the blood can drop dramatically, which can cause, uh, you know, long lasting effects to the bear or even death to the bear because it suppresses uh, all the processes too much. So uh, a really big component of conducting den work the last couple of years has been having a bear health team monitoring that sow while she's under anesthesia. And that bear health team is uh, our veterinarian and our uh, wildlife health biologist, uh, Jen Ballard and AJ Riggs, and either one or both of them have been participating in every single capture event that we've had on these females. And it's also kind of groundbreaking work with the agency and the fact that uh, as far as I know, we're the only agency in the country that has started using BAM during den work. Uh, so it was important for us to monitor and continue to monitor the health of the female through the den work. And of course, the other component of conducting the den work is the data collection that we have on the cubs. Uh, that is besides age and growth data, it's the obvious the sex ratios, the number of uh, males and females during this. But we do collect age and growth ratios just to make sure the cubs are a healthy weight for their age. Um, you know, for years we've collected hair length and everything that you can uh, put in regression models to determine age or parturition dates, birth of the cubs. Uh, so. 
Uh, we also have utilized den work to conduct fostering efforts. Uh, and this was a fostering effort that we actually performed this year. Fortunately, I haven't had the opportunity to do a lot of fostering efforts uh, in the several years, but uh, we do have instances come up every now and then where some cubs will be orphaned early on in the year. And if it's early enough, uh, we can actually take those cubs and foster them to another female. Uh, that is in a den cycle and these uh, two of these cubs there's one of them behind me that you can't see uh, but two of them were fostered cubs and the other two were the cubs of the of the female that we fostered them to so she ended up uh, with four cubs total and fostering efforts do uh, they do work if uh, we're able to get the cubs fostered you know early enough or if they're still females in a den cycle so uh so let's get to some nitty-gritty numbers of it when uh when speaking of reproduction and recruitment we're actually referring to cub and yearling fecundity and the uh, definition for fecundity as it pertains to the bear program is the average number of female cubs or yearlings produced by a female in the population. The average litter size is two cubs, and we're assuming a one-to-one -one sex ratio, which means uh, by definition, we will have one cub every other year or 0.5 cubs per year. So if you look at some of the fecundity rates that we have, the GCP is Gulf Coastal Plain, uh, and the C slash FEC is cub fecundity, the Y slash FEC is yearling fecundity. And if you look over at the far right hand column, you can see for the Gulf Coastal Plain, we have cub fecundity rates of 0.75, yearling 0.56. Uh, I will kind of footnote the Gulf Coastal Plain information those are extremely high cub fecundity rates, which is great. It means they're having litter sizes greater than the average of two cubs per litter. However, uh, I will footnote the GCP information by the fact that it is a very small sample size. Uh, you know, typically, as I said before about spatial distribution, we like to have you know, 10, 12, 15 plus females that we're gathering reproductive data from in a given year, the Gulf Coastal Plain, uh, we're down to just two or three. So uh, <clears throat> that, those are high rates, but it's uh, it's, it's very low uh, numbers of that we're gathering from. So the Washita population, uh, the OU, uh, if you look over, it's probably more typical, uh, you know, what we're going to see across the state. Cub fecundity rates of 0.58, yearling fecundity rates of 0.48. Uh, and the Ozarks, cub fecundity rates of 0.54 and yearling fecundity rates of 0.49. Uh, so really in comparative to other states, uh, we still have a very, very high cub fecundity rates and especially a very high yearling fecundity rates, which actually means uh, we just have a very, very healthy bear population. In some of the states like Louisiana, I know I've spoke with uh, their biologists down there and typically they see yearling fecundity rates of about half of what their cub fecundity rates are. So Arkansas is really doing good uh, as far as fecundity rates of both cub and yearlings. And the fourth and final component, component of the monitoring effort that we do is uh, public participation and education. And really prior to the COVID restrictions that kind of were implemented last year and, and fell through this year, uh, prior to that, you know, we would bear the bear team across the state. We'd take anywhere from 300 plus individuals and, um, you know, we would average 15 to 25 persons per group. And a big part of being able to participate in, in work and all that was, uh, 
after or prior to every den survey, I would give a, a, a bear program and that would cover the history, the biology and the management of black bears in Arkansas. Basically, uh, how we got here, what we're going to do, why we're going to do it, where we're going to do it, the who's, what's, why's, and how's of the day. So, and it really has been a great opportunity over the past uh, couple of decades to introduce really a broad range of the public to AGFC day-to-day -day responsibilities. I mean, it, you know, for a lot of people, it kind of became the face of the agency. Wow, you know, this, so this is what Game and Fish is doing to manage their bears. This is why they do it and everything else. I mean, you know, we've had we've had little kids go along. We've had Boy Scout groups. We've had legislator groups, uh, even governors in the past. Uh, teacher groups, explorer groups, I mean, you name it, just friends and family of, of game and fish employees and everything else. So it really does give us an opportunity to introduce what game and fish does and why to a real broad range of individuals. So what are we drawing from it? Because bears have a very, very low biotic rate it is essential to have good R and R data across bear ranges. And I meant to mention earlier uh, the fecundity rates that we typically look at for cubs and yearlings. That's usually done in blocks. So uh, what I will do is I'll take a block, say five-year blocks, and that's when I'll run numbers on. Uh, so it's kind of a running five-year block of averages or number sets that we have. Uh, real increases or decreases in R and R over time could necessitate changes in harvest strategies or season structure. So, uh, you know, if significant uh, weather events happen, drought summers, late frost in the spring, uh, that have impacts to the food availability for that given year, it could have impacts to the fecundity rates for cubs or yearlings. And, uh, you know, if we see things develop over time, uh, dramatic increases or decreases in something like that, it could necessitate changes to what we're doing, how we have our bear season, uh, how we have it structured. Uh, and not only just a negative impact, but a positive impact. I mean, we continue to liberalize bear seasons in bear zone one and two uh, you know, to compensate for uh, continuously growing populations of bears. And I guess the last con conclusion would be that den surveys are an outstanding educational opportunity for the agency. Uh, like I say, you know, at certain times of the year for certain uh, groups of people, it really kind of becomes the face of the agency. So, any questions? Looks like we've uh, got a question from Blake Sassy. Uh, do you see a lot of variation over time, Myron? No, we really haven't. Uh, you know, that's one reason why I didn't include, you know, blocks of data going back for the last 30 years is really uh, we have not seen very much deviation in cub or yearling fecundity. Uh, for the last 20 years. I mean, it's just, it's been pretty steady and it's just, it's been steadily great is what it's been. <laughs> so. All right. Other questions from Ira? Myron, I, I recall, I, I guess it's been 14 or so years ago now, we had what was, you know, sort of uh, colloquially called the Easter freeze in 2007, where we had a, a very late cold weather event in, in April. And I, I know you found some variation and some, some uh, you know, a slight downturn in, in reproduction. We, we recently had another really uh, cold weather event, what, you know, what what, is you, what do you and your team do? I mean, how do you go about like keeping tabs on that? How does this this presentation that you just gave us factor into future decision making in that regard? Well, uh, I will say that uh, back when we had that Easter freeze back then, uh, we saw dramatic drops in fecundity of cubs and yearlings, and because bears are on a two year cycle, we saw those dramatic drops in 
and cub fecundity for two years in a row, two years after that. Uh, so uh, in response to that, that was why the agency reinstated the quota in zone one was to provide a buffer against those dramatic declines in reproduction and recruitment that we saw two years after that. Now, looking back in retrospect of what has happened to the, our bear population since then, uh, you know, we, I really thought it was uh, going to be a significant impact to the population. Uh, and what we have seen since then is it wasn't even a speed bump. So the frost that we had a couple of years ago, I know I went to Fayetteville uh, last week and coming back from Fayetteville across the Boston Mountains, you could see a definite freeze line from a certain elevation below and everything was brown. So there's no doubt that freeze was going to be a substantial impact to food availability for probably this summer and this fall for a good portion of that. But knowing how the bear population responded, you know, a decade or so ago, uh, there may not be as much of a, quote, knee-jerk reaction maybe this time. I mean, we'll probably kind of take it with a grain of salt and continue to monitor uh, reproduction and recruitment. And if we feel like it is going to be something that was you know, maybe if we have two or three years of it in a row to where we're going to have a sustained impact uh, to the fecundity rates, yes, then we'll probably look at changing something. So, I mean, there's no doubt environmental issues will factor into fecundity rates, uh, but uh, our rates are so great aside from that, um, you know, it's going to take something pretty substantial. Thanks, Myron. Anybody else have questions for Myron before we wrap this up? All right. Seeing and hearing uh, no other questions. Uh, that'll be the, well, we, oh, it's a thank you for Matt Warner. Uh, seeing and hearing no other questions. I appreciate those comments. Uh, thank you, Myron. Thank you, Kendall. Yeah. Uh, and thank you to uh, all of our colleagues from throughout the agency for tuning in. And we look forward to seeing you again next month. Y'all have a good rest of your day.